The biggest problem in education right now is that students are not motivated to learn. That's why they don't come to class. That's why you have to have exams to teach them. If your courses are rooted in real life, you don't need an exam. There are a lot of the syllabus that is taught, especially in certain commerce courses. The last reprint of the syllabus booklet was actually 1997. So we actually even tell you that that 33 lakh package. How did we get to the 33 lakh package? What percentage of offers were from what kind of companies? AI that can do better product management than any masters union, ISB, IIM alum. What are we going to do then? If you are in the top 10% or top 30%, your confidence will get boosted. But if you are in the bottom 70%, your confidence will actually get lost because everyone's competing with each other, and you know it's a zero-sum game. And your content is 10%. 90% is about everything else, which is what education is. All right, so here we are uh, with another interesting video for you. And uh, this is the third year that I have Pratham Mittal with me uh, uh, having this conversation, trying and understanding what he's trying to build with this particular institute, Masters Union. Uh, the two years that we spoke, Pratham, it was unfortunately online, but yeah. now we have gotten this opportunity. Happy to be here and uh, and glad that we could do this in person. So, Pratham, I, I would. Uh, get into it straight, uh, you know, from this question that I had in my mind. Uh, why did Pratham want to establish another institute when we have so many already? Yeah. Like I know, I think you know the count better as to how many V schools are there in India. Yeah. And you're just adding another one another into one. it. So why, why doing that? So it's a great question. And um, uh, there's so many ways to answer this, but I'll, I'll, I'll get to the point, right? There are approximately uh, 17,000 uh, business schools, undergrad, BCom, BBA, all of those combined, right? And 85 lakh Indian students, 85 lakh Indian students do a BCom, BBA or a BA program every year. Right. Right, 85 lakhs. There are total 1 crore students who enter into higher education, 85 lakhs do uh, BBA, BCom or BA. Out of those 85 lakh students, uh, can you imagine how many actually get a job that pays minimum 5 lakh rupees? Oh, I don't know, I can take a shot like... 10%? No. 20%? No, it's 12,000. Whoa. Out of 85 lakhs. That's 0.14%. Wow. Right, that's the real number. So even though there are so many colleges, uh, even though there are so many institutes, uh, similar is true for MBA, right? We have uh, last count around 8,400 MBA colleges. How many students actually get a job minimum 10 lakh rupees? You want to venture a guess? No, I, I, I'm surely sucking at it. I don't know, maybe probably another 5%. No, so 2 lakh students do an MBA, right? Uh, out of uh, every year. And uh, I think the number for more than 10 lakh rupees is less than 8,000. And with the 10 lakh rupees salary, there is no way you can even get a nice apartment, right? In the future. So that's really why we decided to build a business school, right? We decided to build a business school so that we can create a space where we uh, try to experiment with new pedagogy. So at Masters Union, we try to bring in practitioners to come and teach. At Masters Union, we don't have this old system of teaching. We don't have lectures or exams or assignments or you know all of those things. Uh, students actually have to build businesses and run businesses to learn business. Right. And we really think that you know with this new pedagogy, we can hit better placements. We can hit more uh, entrepreneurship. Uh, we can hit more people starting companies. So that's really the motivation. You know those numbers are just too bad. Uh, and you know, if you're trying to build a $5 trillion economy for India, what we have today currently in terms of systems and colleges, we won't be able to do it. I'll come to Masters Union uh, during our conversation later on, Pratham. But I would like to understand this one thing, you know, uh, we are coming from a country, we are from a country where Gurukul was a system yeah. of education in India. And education was seen as something which is very pure and pious, you know, which you can't buy, which does not necessarily go along with money associated with it, right? A lot of these B schools that are coming up, I'm not saying yours, but a lot of these B schools definitely have the money aspect in the back of their mind as to they want to, you know, uh, be the apple of the eyes for people. They want to spend a lot on the marketing. They want to spend a lot in how they are being perceived in the eyes of people, right? Where do you stand in this dichotomy that these B schools have or these education institutes have Oh, today in India? Great question. So, uh, let's talk about two things. I think first is the Gurukul system. I think there was always a Guru Dakshana yeah. at that time as well. So, there is some form of transaction that takes place. 
today i feel like you know let's talk about masters union because i can't talk about masters union we come in and we market ourselves because we want to make sure that people hear about what we are doing right only then are we going to get applicants only then are we going to get students um we are trying these new experiments with pedagogies with teaching systems we want to make sure that reaches the people so we have to market ourselves that's number one number two is why do we charge a fees or why do we charge a fees that's slightly higher right that's because we are providing number one a service it's a premium service and you come to the hotel uh, that is expensive you have to pay a more expensive price right with us also we are trying to provide a premium service we're trying to bring in practitioners to come in and teach we're trying to bring in harvard wharton professors to come in and teach um and so they obviously come with a price tag but at the same time our philosophy is very simple our fees every year will essentially be the placement average salary from last year right so when we talk about fees we think about it in the form of an investment right so if you are paying let's say 30 lakhs in fees can you sort of raise a loan to pay off that 30 lakhs number one yeah. and then are you earning enough every year that you can pay off that 30 lakh loan within 5 to 6 years okay. so that's really how we think about fees right provide a great service and make sure students get outcomes in terms of placements so that they can pay off that loan very easily that's really the 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 system so that's why i mean if you think about it in other than a house education is the most expensive thing you buy yeah like we have all seen in us how education loan is something that a lot of students struggle with. struggle with so in india that's one good thing in india the npa for student loans is very low it's less than 1% in the us it's upwards of 8 9% yeah. in certain geographies so for in india uh, if colleges can continue to do a good job of placing students the loan is not a problem in the us the problem is because in undergrad the cost is too high and that's why the loan bundles up in post grad loans in the us is actually not that bad and in india undergrad loans is not a thing because undergrad in india is very very inexpensive uh, post grad is expensive but those loans have very low npa so pratham you were mentioning uh, you know about the unemployability of these very graduates that we are producing every year uh, in an asagem report it said that you know around only 20% of the people who graduate they are employable uh, in different capacities in different companies right where do you think the problem starts in india for us to have this huge amount of you know the 80% of people who you can't employ it unfortunately starts at the undergrad level let me give you an example if you go to delhi university and a lot of your viewers might be from delhi university and they can corroborate this fact that a lot of the syllabus that is taught especially in certain commerce courses the last reprint of the syllabus booklet was actually 1997 that answers your question right right the thing is that a lot of the government run institutions not all but some of them are not able to update themselves with time number 1 number 2 they are not able to bring in the rigor there are many colleges even in delhi university where attendance is zero it's almost zero yeah. students don't i mean you know this and you're smiling so you know this is true even in bombay we are sitting here right right we have schools government institutions here where there is no concept of attendance sometimes teachers also don't come right so when you have such a sort of lackluster uh, education system of course that's going to reflect in the placements of okay. course that's going to reflect in the employability right so the two issues uh, just to summarize number one is the fact that the syllabus is just so out of tune with time and with the industry a lot of our professors have actually never worked in the industry right in india we glorify this phd concept right but the thing is that a lot of the phd's have actually not worked in the industry so how can they teach what's happening in the industry right right and only now has the government allowed for practitioners to come in and teach yeah right and that also only i think the limit is 20% right number one number two you know what counts as a practitioner uh, in the definition of the government is also very different so not everyone can sort of come in and teach they have to have minimum x years of experience all of that stuff that also complicates things today if you want to learn digital marketing the best person to do digital marketing is probably a 28 year old digital marketer who understands reels who understands youtube who understands instagram that's where marketing is how can a 45 year old person today run digital marketing it's not possible i am 31 and i sometimes myself feel that i'm out of tune with what the latest digital marketing techniques are and i mean if you talk about finance things have moved to fintech there is no finance anymore it's just a reality of the situation right no one is having those books and making lines your credit debit that's not happening anymore but that's what we are still teaching right so that's really the reason why you know pratham i i kind of agree with you you know on that that you know 31 year old pratham is feeling 
that he is outdated or probably he can't catch up with the kind of changing trends that are happening right now. But on this, in the same breath, if uh, you have to say that you know theorizing concepts is important, right? Uh, if you are not building the base, so for example, a lot of these people they are not industry experts who have not worked in certain capacities, right? So if you are not theorizing it for them probably their base is going to be a little weaker. Absolutely. So, what do you think on that? No, it has to be a balance of both, right? So, for example, what we ensure is that each course is co-taught by a faculty and a practitioner. Okay. So, the faculty brings in the theory, the faculty brings in the core concepts, the fundamentals, and the rigor, making sure the students are actually studying, you know, all of that stuff. And the practitioner brings in the story, the practitioner brings in the data, and the practitioner brings in the industry perspective, right? So three things the faculty brings, three things the practitioner brings, and that marriage is what makes education beautiful. Right. So I don't say that only should be practitioners, but I also say that it should not only be faculty. Right. So you're advocating a mixture in B schools of yeah. experience and uh, academics at the same time. Absolutely. But so forty percent academics, sixty percent should be application. Correct. But are you building the same kind of, uh, you know, rigor in your institute as well, where you're bringing in these faculty members, experienced faculty members, and at the same uh, time, the industry experts? Everywhere? Absolutely. So we have, we have a large team of full-time faculty members who are PhDs, right, who do bring in that rigor, and they're very good with theory. But we also have to figure out how can we make theory more interactive, right? right? Because there is a belief, and it's true, that theory gets boring. And when theory gets boring, your attendance levels drop. Right. You know, at Masters Union, we don't do attendance. We want to make sure that our classes are interesting enough that students themselves want to come and not because there is attendance. Right? So it's up to the professor how interesting he or she makes the classroom to be and then students will automatically come. Uh, so our theory classes are also we try to be interesting. So 40% of all of our classes is, is essentially theory. And then 60% is, is all application and run by practitioners. Right. How is Pratham at attendance? No, I think my attendance in when I was in college was was actually quite bad. Um, I think maybe like near to 70, 72 percent. Oh, that's that's good actually. That's good. Yeah. Okay, okay, that's. Uh, so some of the classes that I loved, I used to go there like before time, make sure I get the right seat. We had this one professor who used to teach us um, the economics of European Union. European Union was an up and coming concept back in the day, right? And um, the way he used to teach us European Union was he would narrate us the story of how Airbus the airplane company built the A380 which is their double decker plane and he would explain the entire economics of European Union through the lens of this aeroplane which was so interesting right so what happened was that aeroplane actually got delayed by 10 years because you know parts of it were built in France parts of it were built in Germany parts of it were built in the United Kingdom and when they would all come down to Toulouse in France for assembly none of the things would fit into each other right because they were all using different standards they were all using different uh, you know, plugs and voltage, etc. And that sort of showcased how badly run the European Union is. Right. And till today, it's been 15 years, I have not forgotten it. <laughs> right. And and I'm not sure how European Union has, you know, re-cooperated from that <laughs> space. Uh, but let's talk about, uh, you know, your uh, higher studies. Uh, I'm talking about your UPenn journey, yeah. right? You also went abroad like a lot of these students who decide to go abroad because they're not happy probably with the kind of teaching that they're getting here or the kind of learning that they're having with their peers here. And a lot of brain drain from a very early stage is happening in India right now. What did you figure in your journey there that you could not figure probably in India while you were studying here or when you came back and felt a lag? So I don't think that the American education system does a far better job than the Indian education system. I really don't believe that. I think the only better experience that I had in the US versus that I would have had in India was the fact that all my classmates were from all over the world. Right. So that club that I was part of was very diverse. I think that was the only delta I got there. Other than that, the books that were prescribed in the US were essentially the same books that were prescribed in, the, in India. The professors who were teaching in the US, half of them were Indians. Right. <laughs> right. So the education itself is not too different in the US. We still had to do numericals that we do in India. Yeah. However, there were certain professors who made their classes super interesting, super fun. Like the one that I spoke about who taught That's us correct. the economics of European Union. We had another one called Adam Grant, uh, who I'm sure many of your viewers might be actually following on Instagram. 
He's one of the most popular professors. Uh, face. He teaches organizational behavior. And the way he taught organizational behavior was by making us do activities in class. There was no book. There was no slides. There was, he spoke for maybe five minutes in a 90 minute class. The rest of it was just us working with our classmates on simulations, on activities. Um, there was another class which was about policy making. And one of the, one of the, the titles, the topics in the, in, the, in the project, in the class was about how the food economics works in the US. Right. Okay? And in the US as this concept that people who live below poverty line, they get uh, food stamps mm. where they can only redeem those food stamps for food yeah. and not for let's say alcohol or cigarettes. Yeah. Now you get $16 worth of food stamps. As part of the policy course, all of us actually had to live on food stamps for two months to figure out whether this policy actually works. And what we realized at the end of the course was that it doesn't make any sense because of $16 a week, all you can afford is eggs and potatoes. That's a very starch heavy diet. I mean, if you're giving your kids that diet, you can't expect them to be attentive in school. So we were able to make you know, changes to the policy, we were able to propose. So we were living the course. So there were some of these professors who made their courses super immersive in the real world. And that's what inspired me. Correct. And that's something that is probably important if you are working in the markets also, right? Like I always say this that every 200 kilometers in India, the culture changes, the needs changes, the people changes, right? And uh, if you have to build for them, you have to understand these very people and the kind of requirements and demands that they have uh, for their lives. Uh, is this something uh, that you also follow in this particular institute or you have brought along with you in terms of the teaching pedagogy at MU? Yeah. So let me give you four examples of classes that, that we run. So there's a accounting course, which is an elective, where instead of students having to, um, you know, spend hours like making lines and credit debit, in the very first class, we give them responsibility of a local dhaba. Hmm. And we tell them, hey, listen, here's a dhaba. You're responsible for auditing the books of that dhaba. And the thing is that as soon as, I mean, you haven't even started learning accounting yet, and you get these books. And they realize very early on that the books are out of order. So they spend the first two weeks learning accounting themselves so that they can audit the books. Yeah. Right? And the thing is that learning accounting in a classroom is very different from application of accounting in a dhaba. But that is what real business is. So in the very first accounting class, that's what the students have to do. They have to audit the books of a local dhaba. And you know, when you give them such an important project, because that's important to that person who runs the dhaba, they automatically themselves learn accounting. Right? They're motivated to learn accounting because it's helping somebody. It's a real impact that they're going to create. That's one example. Another example is that in the very first term, all students have to build in small teams a small dropshipping e-commerce website. Right. Right, where they can sell anything they want. They can sell water bottles, they can sell candles, stationery, carpets, anything they can sell. Right. And they do. We had 40 companies get, get started this year. On the last day of the term, students actually have to participate in a fair. Mm -hmm. So we take up a mall space and students actually have to sell their products in real life and compete for revenue. They get to meet their customers, they get to make real revenue. The highest revenue made was upwards of 20 lakhs this wow. year, in six weeks. And so what this does again is it motivates people, students, to learn e-commerce themselves. You know, what we truly believe is that if you can make your courses rooted in real life, you solve the motivation problem. Mm. The biggest problem in education right now is that students are not motivated to learn. That's why they don't come to class. That's why you have to have exams to teach them. If your courses are rooted in real life, you don't need an exam. Hmm. Pratham, uh, you have been to UPenn. Uh, you came back with a lot of these learnings and you are applying these learnings in India right now uh, in the B school that you are running, right? But there are a lot of norms that are changing. UGC has recently come up with a draft policy that they are coming up with where they are saying that the foreign universities and institutes will be able to open campuses in India. They will be able to, you know, decide what fees they want, the kind of curriculum that they uh, want and they will have a free hand in doing that. All that is happening as part of the national uh, education policy that we are talking about or the framework that is being built. Do you see this as a competition? Because a lot of these institutes which are probably the global 500, top 500 B schools who will be willing to establish or set shop in India because of the kind of market that India provides. Although there are like 17,000 B schools that are there, it will be just an addition. Do you feel that this is going to be a competition for you or do you see it in a better light? Very interesting question. So, uh, you know, I've been tracking this policy and I've been tracking and reading the notes and the regulations. Uh, there are two things. First of all, nothing ever stopped business schools from coming in 
to India and setting up shop even before. Hmm. Right. I mean, a Wharton could have always come in and set up shop here. No one ever stopped them. The thing is that why would they want to come to India? That's the question. When Indians are more than ready to go abroad to them. Yeah. Like tomorrow, if let's say, like you know, I get an opportunity to set up a campus in Bombay, let's say, I would never do it. Mm-hmm. When students from Bombay are coming to Delhi to study, why would I go to them, right? And if I go build another campus, my faculty gets divided into two. Mm. That means in my one campus, my students don't get the best because the best is divided into two campuses. So as far as I understand, most top B schools in the world, like let's talk about Harvard, Wharton, Stanford, Yale, Stern, Sloan, NCAD, LBS, I can only think of one that has built a campus outside its main campus. They don't, they haven't, I mean, for example, like Harvard could have built a campus in China. Yeah. They didn't. Harvard could have built a campus in London. They did not. Harvard could have built a campus in Paris. They did not. So why would they come to India and build a campus, right? What is the reason? Uh, those markets are also not small. They could have gone to Indonesia. They could have gone anywhere. So there is no reason why business schools across the world would ever build a secondary campus. Wharton built a second campus in San Francisco. The only reason global business schools or global universities would build a campus in India would be in the form of a satellite campus where their existing students can come to India and do a study abroad program. So, you know, allowing international universities to come in and set up shop, sure, great move, but the economics just doesn't make sense. So I don't think it'll actually happen. Right. Uh, Pratham, let's let's get back to, you know, the kind of academics that you're trying to build or the kind of students that you're uh, trying to build there. When I went there recently in your campus, I saw there is no library. I saw, uh, you know, uh, students spending most of their time outside the classroom, yeah. uh, building something or discussing about something or the other. And you have said yourself that, uh, you know, you don't believe in classrooms, you don't believe in uh, the preconceived notion of lectures or projects or any of that sort. So what are you trying to build? I mean, if uh, these are not the things that are happening in an MBA classroom or uh, MBA curriculum, what is happening? Yeah, let's go to a medical college. Have you been to one recently? Yeah. yeah. In a medical college, first of all, tell me where it is situated. In the hospital. In the hospital. Yeah. In a medical college, how many classrooms are there? Very less. I mean, they usually go and operate and, you know, Exactly. Oh, then students from them. year one, the students are sitting in OPD. For year from year one, they're meeting their um, patients yeah. in flesh and blood, right? From year two, year three, they start working on cadavers, etc. By year five, they're they're essentially running the hospital. They are the seniors, right, who are running the hospital. So that's what we want to build in the context of a business school as well. So we don't care about classrooms as much as we care about being situated inside the business district. So since you came to the campus, you would have seen upstairs is BCG's headquarters. Correct. Above that is EY's headquarters. Above that is Bank of America's headquarters. And so people from these companies come downstairs and spend time with the students. And students go upstairs and do their shadow programs or internships or projects, life projects, etc. So that is the ecosystem community that we are trying to build. Right. Uh, we are deeply inspired, not as much by HBS or Wharton, but by a medical college right next door in Gurgaon. Yeah. Right. Because there's such beautiful teaching happening there. And, you know, I'll give you this one metric. Medical education in India almost has 100% placement. And Indian doctors are the best in the world. Undoubtedly. Right. If you go to the US, if you go to a hospital, 30% doctors are Indians. If you go to UK, and if you look at the senior doctors and the deans, etc., probably 80% Indian. Right. So Indian medical colleges do one thing great, right? Uh, and we are trying to bring that to business school. That's what we are trying to build. Right. Uh, your institute, your campus is in the ground floor. Uh, this is very metaphorical uh, thing that came to my mind. You know, these students are at the ground floor uh, trying to take that lift in yeah, their career right. and get to the BCG office that probably is in the 8th or 10th I, floor. I love it. <laughs> yeah, that's a good, that's, I'm going right. to use that. <laughs> So that's something that came to my mind and you know, it felt like it's in a corporate park. It It is part of bigger business culture that you're trying to develop in the students that are there. That's something that India has been talking about uh, a lot in the last two, three years. They're talking about personal branding. They're talking about startups. They're talking about, uh, you know, the the new economy in general that is being built in the country, right? How do you see these things and how to incorporate these things in the kind of curriculum that you are uh, developing. I know for a fact that, you know, Gazal came to your campus. I know for a fact that Ashneer came to your campus. How do, you know, 
learnings like these actually transpire into real life learning yeah. for the longer uh, so there are two questions here right? the first is the influencer economy yeah so we truly believe that marketing has changed completely right and last year was the first year where more money was spent on influencers on youtube than on youtube ads fascinating figure yeah right super interesting so obviously the trends are shifting so we wanted our students to understand what the influencer economy is like and there is no better way to understand the influencer economy than actually becoming influencers yourself so in term 2 all of our students have to build a youtube channel or an instagram channel it's just compulsory yeah. right and a lot of them are not very comfortable with this because they're like oh no 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 camera i can't face you know i'm not a content creator i was like no just do it for 6 weeks so we make them we force them to do it and some really interesting pages have come out so we have business with bansal with anurag bansal's page is doing really well growing very fast we have a media masala which is yash's page we have so many of these pages now and students really not just learn but immerse themselves in that economy some of them even might hopefully start making money from their pages yeah right no better way to understand influencer economy that's number one number two you mentioned ashni gazal um, next week we have another shark coming which you're more than welcome to attend a show for we have our uh, you know nitin kamath all of these people they keep coming to campus there are two things that this does one is that it really inspires the students you know there's a very interesting socratic uh, concept where you know socrates used to say that education is not about filling a cup like this is not a student and you should not think about education as a syllabus you're trying to fill the syllabus from the book to the student right that should not what education be like he says education is about lighting a flame lighting a candle yeah and that's what we are trying to do at masters and we are not trying to you know make sure the syllabus is filled in the vessel we are trying to make sure that students are inspired right that they want to learn themselves so when you put someone like a gazal alag in front of students on a weekly basis we have someone of that level yesterday yesterday we had the chairman of nestle come in right and talk to students i have never seen students sit in one place look at one person for 2 hours straight and just be like inspired in awe right and when they come out they are thinking about that person they are thinking about how that person did it they are thinking about what that person's dreams were and how he realized his story and that lights a flame right and this year we've also taken up a challenge which i'm happy to announce in your challenge on your channel uh, we've taken a challenge that in the next 52 weeks all 100 unicorn founders would be coming to campus wow that means two founders a week that's what we are aiming for we might be able to we might not be able to depending on the calendar and schedules and all of that but that's our target that's my target as well to bring them on our channel uh, for sure that we can collaborate great. on that <laughs> i i want to understand from you you know the problem in a lot of indian students when it comes to higher education is they don't go to the why of things yeah. they uh, always you know circle around the how of it and the what of it but they never go to the why of it what are you doing in order to make sure that they actually question so i think um the issue is that in india we are not even encouraged to ask questions mm. like you're talking about the what and the how i'm saying even that is not happening as much because we are trained from a very early age to believe what the teacher is telling us we are told from a very early age to believe without asking any questions what our parents are telling us mm. right and that accentuates a certain self serving uh, education system that doesn't work so uh, what we are trying to do i mean it's a great question what we tell our faculty is that you don't speak as much in the classroom yeah. you just tell your story if it's a practitioner or you just tell your concept if it's a faculty and let the students run with it mm. let there be debates let there be conversations let there be uh, students thinking and reflecting about what was just said and make the students question you so for example i also take a class uh, at masters union i teach interactive content marketing which is what i did for 10 years before masters union and in my in my field the game is changing every month like every two months there's a new product there's a new service and even i'm outdated even though i'm from that industry so i just teach the basic human concept of interactive content marketing why it works and then i let it be on the students say hey, how will you you know use this fundamental first principles thought and create your own product and service around it yeah right and now they have to question everything because they've been given a plain slate they've been given a clean canvas you have to draw on it so when you have to draw yourself right when there is no book that you can refer to you'll have to question yourself 
and a lot of questions were raised uh, when you first came up with the placement figures yeah. i would say yeah. uh, that's that was something a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> that's something that put masters in in the map for a lot of b schools as well people started uh, taking you seriously some of them uh, outright say that uh, you know they are bogus they don't uh, come across as uh, you know true b school i would say and i've heard a lot of very colorful other colorful statements as well yeah. or read about them so you know what gives you the courage to be so ambitious if i have to ask you no but first of all i love these statements and people make them because that creates a debate mm. and all that does it gets more views on the placement report <laughs> so uh, you know controversy is always good um, see i mean we are very see that we just tell just talk to our students right all of our student profiles are public on our website including their linkedin uh, profiles so just go there and ask them whether what is true what is not over and above our, prof our our placement report is audited by the same team that audits i amdabad's profile um we in fact wanted that same person to sign off on our report who signs off on i amdabad's report uh to make sure that people don't have this question because we knew that this would be a question um so you know I, but i think first year mein tha wo i think by now it's it's quite understood that master student placements you know are at that level So no, I don't think people question it anymore because it's been two years in a row, and everyone's spoken to our uh, our alums and our students. Now, in terms of what makes us ambitious, to be honest, when we started Masters Union, we didn't have a placement number in our mind. Okay. We have to hit this number. We just trained our students in our own way. We just taught them the subjects that we really thought would be relevant, and we had these outclass challenges which we spoke about where students have to build these small businesses. The thing is that all these things that students do in campus give them a portfolio. So, for example, uh, you know, students who have built, let's say, a YouTube page, or who have built a dropshipping company, or who have built a mobile app, or who have built a food business, or a blockchain protocol, they have done all of these things, and all of these things get added to their portfolio. Yeah. So, when they go to a company for a job, they go with the portfolio mm. more than the CV. And when you go for with the portfolio, that is proof of work. That is proof of work. So, when that is the case, the companies want them. these people become irresistible to the companies yeah and of course then we train them in placements also we make students do uh, customized cvs for each company which are very artistic in nature i'll give you an example one of our students she was very interested in netflix mm. very interested in netflix so she actually created a resume in the form of a netflix show did she get through no actually <laughs> that's it's okay. super interesting yeah it is but she got another brand management job because of that right because netflix only has 10 people in india they don't even recruit from but she put that effort right and and all of our students put this kind of effort and because of that they become irresistible to the company right if if you were in netflix i'm sure you would interview her at least sure i mean at least she will find my attention for find sure attention mm. right now when that happens the placement numbers automatically rack up that's number one number two the other thing is that a lot of the practitioners who teach when they are teaching they know who the good students are mm. so they hire them for themselves so correct Uh, next week we have someone he's a mckinsey partner who's teaching a full course at masters union right he knows who the students are so we didn't even have to go and pitch masters union to like a bain bcg or mckinsey they they were teaching on campus uh, let's talk about uh, the placements uh, this particular cohort um, i met a few of them uh, you know that ranged from somebody who has had an experience of 7 to 8 years mm -hmm. who have come in and joined the program and you know gotten a job somebody who's a rank fresher somebody who has spent probably 1 2 years and uh, they have their own startups and they want to learn business and they came in here that's the kind of diversity i saw in the kind of placements that were happening do you consider certain things before you select these students as part of this institute knowing very well that you know these are the very people i'll easily be able to place or these are the very people i don't want to take because they'll be very hard to place I think it's very hard to know who you can place who you cannot place. Right. right. Only the industry can find that. Mm. I don't think we are the right people to judge that. Uh what we are able to judge is whether this student will learn from us. Whether this student is open to learning, open to ideas, open to debate, open to discussion, open to taking instructions, open to questioning. So, you know, we look at three things in our application process. Uh we ask for essays which are probably the most important aspect of the application i would say 30 35% of whether you get into masters union or not is going to depend on your essays every year has have you done something that that has changed you that has taken you forward do you have a growth mindset 
we see that from the ladder that you have sort of taken. And we have students who had gap years, which could not be explained. We had students who tried for UPSC for three years, but couldn't do it. Right. But in their essays or in their story, they were able to tell us how in each year they grew as human beings. In fact, it's maybe 20-25%, right? which is their undergrad scores, their class 12 scores, class 10 scores, and their you know, GMAT, GRE, CAT scores. Right? What we want to see from this is not that you've been a high achiever throughout, but that you've grown, right? that there is a certain pattern. Uh, we don't care if you had a 60% in class 10. We really don't care if in your CAT, you have improved over time. So, so that's what we look at. That's it. This year's average package is somewhere around 33 lakh, yeah, if I'm not lakh. wrong. And uh, that's definitely competing with the kind of best institutes in the company, uh, country. I'm not aware of the other figures because I don't give a lot of uh, you know prominence to the numbers at all. Uh, although I've been in this space for quite some time, I don't judge a B-school basis that. But the perception is such that Masters Union gives the best uh, sort of packages or at least it says or it projects itself as the, the B school that gives these kind of numbers. How true are these numbers? That's my first question. Second question is, uh, which are these companies that came in this year to pick students sure. which made you, you know, reach to this particular sure. number? So, um, the first point, um, you know, we want to be fully transparent. So we actually even tell you that that 33 lakh package, how did we get to the 33 lakh package? Sure. Right? What percentage of offers were from what kind of companies? How many students got 17 lakhs? How many students got 24 lakhs? How many students got 40 lakhs? How many students got 60 lakhs? No one ever says that stuff. We give it out in the open. We actually give a histogram of how many students fall in each category. Of, and there are students who have gotten 15 lakhs also. Hmm. That's okay. Correct. Right? They chose, uh, maybe they chose marketing, which pays slightly less. Right? And there are some kids who got 60-65, maybe they chose Fintech, that pays a lot more. Right? So that's totally depending on what they want to choose in their lives. Right? The other thing is that we are very transparent about how that 33 lakhs is divided amongst fixed component, variable component and restricted stock options. Right? We, so we are very clear that the fixed component is only 25 lakhs. We are very clear that the variable is around 3 to 4 lakhs and that RSUs are also 3 to 4 lakhs. Right. We are also very transparent about the fact that, hey, listen, we only count RSUs for year one and not for five years, which every other business school does. And they say it also. I mean, they're not hiding it. They say it on their placement reports that we count RSUs for the entire uh, duration of the employment. You know, there are three sets of companies. First set of companies are the companies that come to all business schools, all top business schools, right? So, for example, Bain, BCG, they go to all IIM, Ahmedabad, Bangalore. Uh, I think one of them did not go to Calcutta this time, ISB, etc. So, so these companies, uh, they go to all business schools, they also come to us. These are your erstwhile consulting companies. Then there are companies that are startups, but like maybe series D, series E, like a razor pay, like a Zerodha, right? Um, which are super interesting. These are large companies, uh, not really startups anymore, but the good thing about these companies is that students grow really, really fast. Yeah. They don't have to be part of a bureaucracy or ladder. They grow very, very fast. And the third kind of company is super interesting. These are smaller companies. These are companies, maybe 30, 40 people, but they are super high tech. Mm. Maybe they are in electric vehicles, yeah. right? Like Aether, right? Where uh, the chief of staff is a student. Um, maybe a company like uh, General Aeronautics, which is a hardcore drone company. They make agri drones, defense drones. And a student who was an erstwhile electrical engineer has gone there as a product designer. So that's a very small company, but my student is there as a founder's office uh, person, right? So uh, those are smaller companies. They don't really go to business schools. And we try to get these opportunities for our students who are interested in that field only. Like for example, we had Abhishek who was super interested in advanced data analytics. He did not want to go anywhere else. He could have gotten hired anywhere. But he wanted to do advanced data analytics. So he's gone to Euclid, which is a you know boutique data company. Pratham, very interesting, you know, the the kind of breakup that you gave is the kind of transparency that I was looking uh, from you, you know, because there are a lot of questions and a lot of speculations that are around uh, in this particular B school. I mean, once you guys are like five years, six years, ten years down the line, and you have this track record intact, probably people will not question you yeah, anymore, fair. right? I'm interested in knowing in these next 5-10 years that you are uh, talking about or we are talking about what are some of the sectors and the industries or the kind of skills that people should put in or 
uh, you know work towards harder in order to you know get through to the best offers possible that's a loaded question um see you know fintech did not exist 5 years ago mm. and now it exists a lot of industries after chat gpt etc things are going to change in the next 2 3 absolutely. years absolutely right? i mean this year was a what just absolute... happened right what happened this year we don't know right maybe someone makes a ai that can do better product management than any masters union isb i am alum what are we going to do then so i think like i will not be able to predict which skills or which industries will do well but i will tell you one thing that there's a certain dna that some people possess which makes them evergreen which they can apply to any industry and they'll be okay which they can apply to any role and they'll be okay and that dna i can't think of a better word than hustle like i've given you a job ab ye job ho jayega right i can just like as a boss i can just forget about it i've given this ex person a role a job a target and i can just sit back and relax and watch him do it or watch her do it that hustle that that person has that can be applied to any role any job so we should ask ourselves this question all of us should ask ourselves this question on a scale of 0 to 10 how big of hustlers are we are we hustlers at all right yadi kisi ne kuch kaam diya to kya main wo 100% certainty se karke de sakta hu ab usme main excuse nahi dunga ab usme main din raat nahi dekhunga weekend nahi dekhunga usme main ye nahi dekhunga ki dusra banda kya kar raha hai main apna kaam karke dunga right so it's a very basic simple thing but that's where most people falter what kind of a boss are you pratham and uh, you know if somebody is actually trying to start a business of their own yeah. because that's something that a lot of these b school graduates are also interested uh, what should be their ideal way forward so to answer your first question i think i don't i think i need to do an mba myself <laughs> uh, to Correct. learn better management uh, i have my weaknesses as well mere ko gussa aa jata hai bahut jaldi so i have certain uh, misgivings which i have to work on um uh, So to be honest, I have to work on that. Um, for others, I feel like you can only learn management by managing people. There is no management framework that can actually help you in the real world. That's why we don't have a class on management frameworks at Masters Union from the only business school in the world, right? Because there is research done by professors, by researchers that states very clearly that human resource management. is not something you can be trained for yeah it's something you can only be trained for on the job there is no education if there was then you know like i mean i mean that would make life very easy yeah. but it's not easy can we say that uh, b schools actually uh, insert or inject confidence and communication skills these are the two things not all not all business schools um i think some business schools take away from the confidence let's say see what happens is like you know this day zero day one placement system it's a pressure cooker mm. isn't it it is right if you are in the top 10% or top 30% your confidence will get boosted mm. but if you are in the bottom 70% your confidence will actually get lost because everyone's competing with each other and you know it's a zero sum game there are 60 companies that come to campus right and batch of 500 students and everyone's competing mm. and so if you lose the competition obviously going to hit your confidence right we don't have this day zero day one thing our our placements run for over 6 months right and, and students are not forced ki 12 baje interview do 2 baje tak response karo we don't do all of that so that takes away from the confidence that takes away from the flair finding a new job should be something you celebrate you enjoy it should not be a pressure cooker all right this day zero day one thing i i can't imagine how people do this by the way in the us in business schools in the us stanford wharton no concept of day zero day one day two nothing their placements run for years it's not in two days ki hame sab khatam karna hai that entire day zero day one process was actually built for the companies not for the students it benefits the company ki companies ko thok mein bacche mil gaye it's not good for the students at all students don't get to negotiate in two hours what will you negotiate yeah do you teach your students how to negotiate with companies as well so we we try to negotiate on their behalf right. we try to negotiate on their behalf because i think we have more leverage than the students sometimes right. so we are able to negotiate better our target is very clear that in 5 years from now in 2028 1st january we want to be top 10 business schools in the world right now the top 10 is 
Wharton, Harvard, Stanford, Stern, Sloan, LBS, NCAD, uh, which one? Northwestern, right? We think we can be ninth or tenth in five years from now. We are not talking about India. We are not talking about Asia. We are talking about world. Global, and this is Financial Times ranking, which is the gold standard of MBA rankings. Yeah. Uh, until Inside IM comes with one. <laughs> you have course, to change your name from Inside IM to Inside <laughs> Business School. Or yeah. But but that's what we're looking at. Right? We do not intend to grow in terms of number of students at all. That's not going to be our philosophy at all. We are going to be stable at around 240 to 50 students. And we're only going to work on uh, our ranking. And how are you going to deal with criticism? And how do you deal with criticism in general? Like, do you take these criticism constructively, or uh, do you keep them at bay and you know move forward? I mean, I think if I think if people started, uh, you know, listening to trolls, like you will not be able to work only. Uh, so yeah, we don't really regard that. And I mean, I, I've worked in social media industry before to know that doesn't matter. The feedback that we take very seriously is the feedback from our recruiters. Hmm. And how has that been? So far, it's been good. I mean, all the recruiters have come back for year two, year three. So they must have seen something good in the students. That's why they came back. Otherwise, they can easily say no. Um, and a lot of the large recruiters are also taking a risk by coming to Masters Union. Yeah, It's their, uh, you know, Bain BCG, they don't come to any campus. You know that, right? I think probably six or seven campuses they go to in all of the country. Um, and they added us and they've kept coming back. That's reaffirming uh, our belief. So uh, they give us feedback. Sometimes it's constructive. Sometimes it's critical also. And then we fix that. So we have people who work, who are from ISB. We have people from HEC Paris. We have people who are from MDI. We have people who are, who are from IIM Ahmedabad. In our placements team. Yeah, and the placement team, please go to LinkedIn and see them, their profiles. Those are the people who are running placements. We run placements like we run a sales organization. And I really like this line that uh, you know you ended this answer with. Uh, I want to end our uh, conversation here today by asking you this very question that I ask a lot of directors that I meet, the founders uh, that I meet. You know, in the kind of times that we are living in today, YouTube probably is the biggest ed tech platform yeah. or the teacher that you might find. And when you have so much at your disposal, uh, so much that you can learn from there, if you are serious enough, why do you even need uh, an MBA degree? Absolutely, 100%. If business schools or if colleges provide content only, then they'll be out of business. They're already out of business. We, as I said, in a class that is one hour or two hours long, the teacher does not give content for more than 10 minutes. Yeah. Content is not what a business school should stand for because content you can get on YouTube for free, you're right. It is three things. It's community. You learn with people. Mm. You learn from people. You grow together. Number two is problem solving. You cannot learn that on YouTube, right? It's only when you're given a project, when you're working on that project, when you stumble when you make mistakes that's when you grow right people don't grow by reading by watching by even application people learn when they make mistakes and that's what a business school gives you a platform to do when kids make these businesses they make one mistake they build another business they make another mistake that's how they learn and third it's they learn in the hostel you learn when you have a breakup you learn when you make friends you learn when you set up uh, a, a theater workshop, you learn when you, you know, play a sports game. Those learnings that happen again and again. So it's not about content at all. Education is not about content. That's the mistake we make. Edu content is 10%. 90% is about everything else, which is what education is. If I ask you a question that when you were in college, tell me about your top five memories. Well, I mean, with friends, with uh, the kind of time that I've spent with them. But none of those top five will be in the classroom. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely not. Right? That means content doesn't matter. Your learnings, if I were to ask you your top five learnings from your undergrad times, none of those learnings will be, oh, I learned this numerical, this concept, this Bayes theorem. It will never be that for any human being. That's why content doesn't matter. Right. That's why physical institutions will always exist, no matter how many tech companies come. Pratham, uh, how important is failure to you? How important is failure for people who are trying to aim big in their lives? And what would be your advice to students right now who are grappling with failures in their life? I think like you cannot think of one successful person in this world, one successful person who's not failed 
out of 10 times, at least 7 times. I think 10 things you'll do, 7 will always be failures. That's just the, I think, law of the land. Yeah. Three that you'll succeed in is what you work towards. I mean, from Jeff Bezos to Elon Musk. I mean, we, we look at them as like, oh, wow, like so successful. But they've had failures. It's just that nobody talks about them. We have success series, but we don't have failure series yeah. in terms of podcasts, in terms of shows. I think we should have one of those, right? We should talk about the failures. Um, so, yeah, I think failure is something that, you know, is part of any game. Like when you're playing snake and ladders, you're going to get bitten. You're going to want to go down. But you will finish the game eventually. Right? The... So that's how the odds are stacked. So I think it's part of the process. Just deal with it and move on. Doesn't matter. You know, you'll never fail again and again and again and again. Like there will come a time where you will succeed. Like it's just law of the land. Superb. And you will definitely succeed if uh, you are prepared for the kind of future and the times that are ahead. Oh, thank you very much, Pratham, for being so candid today with us. Having this conversation with us, opening up about so many things, about the institute that you're trying to build or the kind of students or the minds that you're trying to build or create for the future. Uh, if you want to know more about this particular institute, uh, there's a link in the description. Uh, you can go check that out, uh, get some more information about the kind of program that Pratham and his team are trying to create or build. Uh, do tell us in the comments below if you have any questions that we uh, can send to them and uh, share this video with people who probably are interested in our in the crossroads of whether to do an MBA or not. Thank you very much. Pratham. Thank you so much for Once having me. Again, uh, if you can, uh, you know, talk to our audience, looking at the camera, telling them uh, anything that you want to leave them with. No, guys, I mean, uh, uh, you know, it's a very interesting world that we're living in. Um, India is going to grow at 10, 12 percent for the next five years. That means in eight years, all of our incomes will double. Right, the per capita income of India will double. Right? That means that that is the kind of growth opportunity we are seeing in front of us. So make sure you ride the wave. You know, India is a huge wave. And as surfers, we have to ride the Indian wave uh, and not get left behind. Right? So India is the best country to be in in the world right now. And I congratulate all of us. And it's incredibly lucky that we are living in this life, uh, in this, this time in India. Lovely. Thank you very much, Pratham. Uh, it was nice meeting you in person. I really enjoyed my Likewise. chat. I thought that, uh, you know, I would unearth some uh, truth, realities, existing realities with you. And I'm sure uh, some of them were uncovered today. Uh, I will not hold you back anymore. I, I know for a fact that you have a day long program here. So enjoy your time thank at you St. So Regis. And thank you for calling us here and thank having you. this conversation today. Of course. Thank you so thank much. Thank you. All the best. Thank you.